This video is brought to you by Fractal and the Meshify 2 Lite. Lite? As in light on your wallet. Now, I've reviewed the Meshify 2 previously, and you should definitely check out that review video. The Meshify 2 Lite issues a few features to save money, but the savings are passed on to you. The biggest difference that you'll notice aesthetically is the top is different. It's riveted in. No removability. And the top dust filter is magnetic. In truth, there are a number of differences. Fractal has supplied a helpful table showing us what the differences are, but this still makes a perfectly fine and reasonable platform to build in. We still have two front USB 3.0 5 gigabit ports. The USB Type-C port is optional in the light version. You can add that later, but if you're not going to use front panel C, if you miss it, you can add it, but don't fear of missing out on the Type-C. It's very rare even that I use it. You still get three fans. You still have the cool opening door on the front. You still have the dust cartridge for the bottom. And you still got tons of room for expandability and upgrades on the inside. In other words, you're not really giving up much at all for a build like this. If you're going to use this as the platform that you're going to build, you still get rubber grommets and it's still really thick metal construction. And it's no secret that I'm a big fan of Fractal cases. So thanks Fractal for sponsoring this video and uh, check out the Meshify 2 Lite link below if you're considering something like this for an upcoming build. Now in our last video, we took a look at a trio of possible candidates for your home server, including this wonderful little Supermicro ITX system. Now the reality is that these systems at idle are gonna use about 35 watts, and most of that is just keeping your spinning rust spinning. Our configuration is two 20 terabyte mechanical hard drives, which I think is plenty for most home users. In fact, if that's extreme maximum overkill, you might think about going with a flash-based solution. You know, four terabyte SATA hard drives are more affordable than ever, for sure. But yeah, most of that power goes to keeping your spinning rust spinning. But with what we're gonna do on the software side, when the thing isn't busy, the hard drives can actually turn off. And then your system is gonna idle more like 10 watts, 12, 15, something like that. But the software setup was a little more involved. I was gonna cram it into the other video, but it turns out there's a lot of pitfalls and there's a lot of things that noobs can get frustrated over. And I'm gonna show you some hard-won knowledge in setting up TrueNAS, because out of the box, when you set up a virtual machine on TrueNAS, it can't access the host. Yeah, I'm gonna show you how to fix that. It's actually in the level one guide if you wanna skip ahead or follow along. If you prefer a written guide, there is a written guide. This video goes with that to hold your hand through the written guide and to explain things as we go along, but I've got to go to my desk because I can't do it standing up at this desk. When you first log into TrueNAS, this is the system that we set up in the last video. I've got a dashboard and system information and TrueNAS help and oh, we can see that I've got 64 gigs of memory and, and blah, 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 and the link state is up and everything's good and CPU. This is a really low cost, very quiet home server, 35 watts. You can have 20 terabytes of space in a system that's 35, 40 watts nominally, 12 cores, 20 threads. Anyway, our storage here is two 20 terabyte mechanical hard drives. Um, optionally, I would recommend the ZFS metadata special device. I did a whole other write up on that. You can store a map of which files uh, are stored where on the mechanical hard drives uh, and store it on NVMe. You can also store really small files along with that on, on NVMe. And so it really dramatically speeds up a lot of these operations. If you do a lot of stuff with virtual machines, you can also use multiple NVMe namespaces. It's like a partition, but it's a hardware partition. So you can get a couple of cheap two terabyte NVMe drives and let's say make 512 gigs or a terabyte of the NVMe one namespace and use a mirror of those for your metadata and then use the rest of the NVMe for you know, a RAID Z mirror for uh, your virtual machine storage or your Docker container storage or whatever you wanna do. As awesome as this is, it'll monitor your hardware. It'll give you little alerts here and say like, oh my gosh, your hard drive, a variable changed and something is going sideways. As awesome as this is in terms of data protection and shares and everything else, it has an app system. Applications are not running, available applications manage catalogs it has this thing called true charts it is sort of clunky and not great to use and not super transparent about what's happening with your data 
and the couple of times that I've used it, I've managed to trigger bugs so severe that it would generate like 60,000 snapshots after I let it sit for a couple of weeks. And that's not a great situation. So I just decided to use the virtualization thing and create a virtual machine. And that's what the guide walks you through. Step by step is I created a, a, a new data set on our um, Z pool and I created a folder called ISOs and I copied the Debian 11 ISO. The reason that it's Debian 11 is because this is the same kernel version as the host machine. It's, it'll probably be fine. Also, we're gonna run Docker and Docker runs fine on Debian 11. So copy the ISO, configure the virtual machine through the GUI. We can literally just go add to add the virtual machine. We can pick Linux for the operating system, the name. I just called it Docker stuff. System clock, local, boot method, UEFI, VNC, next, all that's fine. I've got 20 threads, 12 cores. I just gave it 12 cores. One virtual CPU, 12 cores, one threads per core. So it'll just, it's 12, like six or eight would probably be fine here. If you're running an i3, like two or four would be fine. CPU mode custom, I did host pass through. This part doesn't really matter. GPU, uh, uh, host pass through. And I gave it eight gigs of RAM. I got 64 gigs of RAM total, but I'm gonna give it 8,000 megs, which is not quite eight gigs, but hey, you know, it's fine. Disk type AHCI, it's totally fine. The Zvol location tank actually ended up, uh, yeah, tank is fine. And the size, I made 100 gigabytes. Now we're not gonna use the virtual machine for storage. See, the thing that you run into, like we step back and we, we talk big picture here. This virtual machine, the temptation is to store the Docker stuff inside the virtual machine. That means all of your important Docker data is gonna live in this one virtual machine hard drive file. But it's hard to take advantage of the really awesome stuff that ZFS has in terms of snapshots and uh, compression to a lesser extent and some of the other features if you can't get at your files from the host operating system as they exist in the virtual machine. This puts them all in a, in a virtual hard drive file. Also, it's a little bit ephemeral. So everything that's gonna be in this virtual machine hard drive file, I really don't care about. We're gonna set up Docker to actually connect back to the host and store all of its stuff on the host. And that's actually not something that works out of the box with TrueNAS and hasn't worked for two years, but that's okay. I'm gonna show you how to fix that. And that's in the guide. Network adapter, attach it to a NIC. Now in your dropdown, you're gonna have something other than, than BR0. And uh, that's okay. That's the first sign of something, a problem that's coming. You can just pick whatever you want there, do next, and you're good to go. For the installation media, you can browse and pick the ISO. See, there's my ISO folder. I picked Debian GPU. We're not gonna do anything with GPU. This is an Intel system, so it does actually know that it can pass through the Alder Lake GT1, but we don't, we don't need that. We're gonna do next save it's going to create the virtual machine it'll boot off of the cd as you see in the guide and then you have this and you next through and you create your virtual machine i just turned on the ssh server and standard system utilities you don't need a desktop environment i accidentally left it checked you should uncheck it from there we can install docker according to the documentation that's also pretty straightforward you just copy paste some commands from then it's like you can do ip-4a and it's like hey it's bridged it's on the network everything's good oh but wait it, you can't ping the host. So my uh, TrueNAS machine was 192.168.1.1 and this virtual machine was 192.168.1.2. So I could ping everything else on my network, but I couldn't ping .1.1. The reason for that is out of the box, TrueNAS doesn't create the network stubs the way that it should, which is amazing. Debian used to be like that in 2006. And it's been fixed since like 2007 or eight. So I don't know what has happened here, but when you have the networking stack set up this way, the uh, kernel will not route traffic from the virtual machine to the actual host. It just dumps it on the network and it doesn't need to dump it on the network when it's traffic bound for the host. Because this is broken, it means that if you have a file share like NFS or Samba, you're not gonna be able to access the file share that your true NAS machine is hosting from any virtual machines that are running on it. This is brain dead. And there's actually several threads about this in the bug tracker and other stuff. So I'm sure that it's on IX systems radar. 
And that's probably why some of the moderators in the community over there are a little bit rude when you ask about this. Further, the web GUI is actually broken. So you're gonna have to use the console to do this. This would be, would be my recommendation. When you plug in a VGA monitor on your TrueNAS system, it gives you a text console. You can get a Linux command line thing and you can do a lot of stuff there to fix that. And that's how we've done it in past tutorials. But in this case, we can actually just use the little setup menu here that we have to fix it. So we'll go into the network settings, we'll create a new interface and the interface that we're going to create is called a bridge. We're gonna call the bridge BR0. And then for aliases, that's where you enter the IP address. It's an IP alias. It doesn't really make that super clear. And if you're uninitiated, uh, you might be wondering WTF, but you put the IP address in there. You don't want to DHCP on any of this. And then for the bridge members, you need to pick the interface that is gonna be bridged. If you have like the super micro system that has two physical NICs, you can leave one physical NIC connected with an IP address and then use the other physical NIC to create the bridge and you create the bridge on that NIC. And then your virtual machines will have the bridge with the second NIC and then the uh, true NAS machine will have an IP address on the first NIC. There's usually a second IP address on the same subnet on the second NIC by the time we start there. But this also works just fine with one NIC, but you can forget using the web GUI. So when you go through all that and you change it, you're gonna get some black stuff on the screen that says, hey, the network changes have been applied, but I'm gonna revert this and roll it back in 46 seconds. The problem is that with the bridge, it doesn't roll it back correctly. Your, your machine will still be inaccessible and it leaves things in a really undefined, weird state that I had a hard time fixing from the command line and ultimately I had to reboot the machine. So just, it's broken in this at this point, but go ahead and hit P to, to save the changes. Uh, and if you drop to a command prompt, you'll find that everything is still broken. It's not actually forwarding traffic. That's okay. If you did everything correctly, go ahead and just reboot the machine. When you reboot the machine, it will reapply the settings without having the broken settings that it started with. And when it applies the correct bridge settings, it will actually bring everything up and everything will work correctly. All you'll have to do is go back to the GUI for virtual machines and edit your virtual machine and change the network part of it You'll have to go to devices, uh, actually. You have to go to devices and the network card and edit and change the NIC to BR0 if it wasn't. I found it easier to set it up before doing the bridge thing. And that's when I discovered, oh wow, this is still broken and it has been broken for years. Good Lord. And also like noobs tripping over this. Like this would be like some sort of crazy black magic if somebody wasn't explaining to you. It's like, well, it's literally taking the traffic from the virtual machine and just dumping it on the wire without considering if the traffic needs to be dumped on the wire because traffic that is bound from the virtual machine to the machine that's hosting the virtual machine doesn't actually go on the wire. It's just serviced locally. And so now it makes sense. There's more to it than that. I'm leaving some stuff out. I'm a little frustrated because I went through setting up five of these systems uh, for this video, well, for the last video and this video to, to sort of see how the performance was and, and that sort of thing. And um, it was broken in different ways. And this is the only way to sort of consistently fix it. But once you reboot, you should see entered forwarding state. And everything should work fine. You should be able to ping everything. Everything's good. Now, all we have to do is set up the NFS share for TrueNAS. So we go to storage and click the vertical dot 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 and add a data set. And we want to go into advanced options and set NFS v4 and pass through. Uh, you can go back to the uh, Debian Docker virtual machine and just do apt install NFS common. And what I wanna do is create a folder at the root that's just for our NFS share. And I wanna always instruct Docker to store its persistent volumes in this share. So with Docker, you have a pretty good ability to separate what's your data from the infrastructure and code that um, the people that put the containers together provide. And so when we're talking about Nextcloud, there's this whole thing with Nextcloud, it's got calendaring and you can upload documents and there's a thing to process MP3s. There's a lot of code there, there's a lot of files. But when you upload a document, that's yours. And if you need to upgrade Nextcloud or you need to do something with managing it, your stuff being entangled with all of that other stuff is very undesirable. Containerization goes a long way to solve that. So we can say this folder is user stuff and we want that to survive and persist. 
and we can destroy all of the other stuff, but this folder, this should persist. So with Nextcloud, that's var www.html, which still admittedly is a little bit of a mess. There's a lot of stuff that goes in there that's not yours, but that's the folder we need to preserve that's gonna have data and everything else in it uh, as time moves forward. That's a volume. But anyway, we're gonna make a directory slash NFS and we're gonna mount that you know, mount 192.168.1.1 slash MNT slash tank slash NFS docker slash NFS. Now to make sure this is all working, we can try to create a file here. It's like, oh, okay. Now that doesn't work. There's permission to not. That's okay. This is how you troubleshoot that. Cause I wasn't expecting this either. It's, well, okay. It was a little bit. I sort of short circuited things here. It's kind of a best practice to create a user set of credentials on TrueNAS that uh, this virtual machine will connect as and do work as. So I'm gonna go ahead and create an NFS Docker user and set a, a, pa a random complicated password as a starting point. And then the next part is we need to edit the NFS share, NFS Docker, and tell it the map user and map root groups correspond to root and root. This is because we do need to change permissions on the NFS share. This is not strictly speaking a best practice, but for a home, user setup, this is probably okay. And I'm not sure if there's a, a better, cleaner way um, to deal with this. Also, when we created that user, it created another folder under NFS Docker that was the username. That's the user's home folder. So I'm gonna update the mount on the Debian Docker host to be slash MNT slash tank slash NFS Docker slash NFS DCKR, which is the name of the user, and just mount that at slash NFS. Now we can touch hello world. It creates hello world, we're good to go. The next thing that we gotta do is add the portainer GUI to manage our Docker system. We're gonna modify their example command a little bit though. See the dash V portainer underscore data. Remember what I said, without the leading slash, it's just gonna let Docker manage the containers. And by default, that's stored locally. That means stored inside that virtual hard drive file for a virtual machine. We don't want that. We wanna store that on NFS. So it's gonna be slash NFS. So the change here is pretty easy such NFS slash portainer data. Also notice that in their documentation, they refer to a lot of things as portainer enterprise edition. Well, that's licensed, that'll cost you money. There's also a community edition. So portainer dash CE, not portainer dash EE, is what we're gonna be using for all of our stuff. Now we mounted that NFS volume manually. That means it won't survive a reboot. We need to edit our uh, FS tab and set it to mount automatically on reboot. And the breakdown of this is basically it's the IP address of your free NAS machine or your true NAS machine, and then the path that you want to mount and then where you want to mount it in the VM. NFS is the type, RW, async, no A time, and hard, and double zero. This is also the point where I discovered that uh, I probably want NFS v4 instead of v3, which is a service you can change in uh, the shares section of free NAS. So if we go to NFS here, so we go to system system settings and services and NFS and hit the pencil. Enable NFS v4. NFS v4 should be a little bit more performance and should work pretty well in this use case. It's not on by default and that's okay. You don't, don't feel like you have to change it, but I changed it and I did the rest of the tu tutorial from here in NFS v4 mode. So. When you get that reboot and just verify that slash NFS is, is still working. And if it is, proceed. And if not, comment on the level one forms and we'll try to get you sorted. You can reconnect via SSH to your, uh, you know, Debian Docker host and do Docker PS-A to confirm that, you know, everything is still running. You can rerun re Hello World if you need to or create or restart your, your portainer. Portainer should now be accessible at the IP address of your VM colon 9443. Docker PS-A will show you that in the, uh, in the far column. You should be greeted by the Portainer GUI. It'll ask you to set a username and password. And then from there, we can set up Nextcloud. Now Nextcloud's a little complicated. It's got a database component and it's got a storage component. And the database component is based on MySQL. This it can even manage multiple Docker hosts. Like if you had more than one Docker host, it would show here. It's really, there's, there's so much learning you can do here. If you get good with this, you can get a job tomorrow. It's pretty crazy. All right, we got Portainer set up and I honestly didn't expect it to be this much work to get to where we are. It, it makes sense and it's a good learning exercise and it's, it's good that you've done all the work up till now. But from here, I think it's a lot easier and also a lot more forward compatible 
uh, meaning that when you upgrade your TrueNAS system, this is going to survive the way that we've set it up with the NFS data sets and everything else that we've gone through. So it's pretty easy to go from here to add something like say Nextcloud. So we wanna set up Nextcloud. Nextcloud also has a database and some other dependencies and some volumes and blah, blah, blah. Sometimes you read the tutorials, it talks about using a Docker compose file. And so we can basically do the same kind of thing in Portainer with stacks. I put all the Nextcloud stuff in Nextcloud at slash NFS. And you'll wanna set some passwords that are not change me one, two, three, and the username in the database. And then the next cloud. And so this is gonna create multiple containers, basically is what's going on. There's a container for the database and there's a container for, for next cloud. Because you don't wanna run the database inside the next cloud container, that's just silly. So this you can paste into the stacks area of Portainer. So there's a web editor here and you just paste it. And then you can hit update or deploy and then you'll get these two containers next cloud app and database and you can even hit the little log and see what the log says and so it's like okay we've created the database and everything is good to go this is really super handy these are shortcuts for things you can do from the command line but portainers gui is very well thought out very well organized and very very good hey back on containers we can see we got the app and the database we can click on the app i kind of want to take a look at the logs because it takes a little while to do the initial setup of next cloud we just have the initializing next cloud 24.0.2.1 which will take a little while so i noticed that it was taking a little while to initialize on our next cloud and normally it doesn't really take that long so it turned out what the problem was that because we're mounting this volume you know over nfs over network file system it was taking a while to uh initialize because it's next cloud normally writes one file at a time and make sure that that file is written before writing the next one there's a little bit of overhead with that. In NFS, that's called synchronous writes. So I decided to disable synchronous writes using the shell ZFS set sync equal disabled tank slash NFS docker on the whole docker share so that uh, it would basically return immediately without waiting for the write to complete. It's a little compounded by the fact that we're on mechanical spinning hard drives. This would actually be a lot faster if I had a, a separate log device or slog device that, uh, ZFS supports in this particular case, it would have helped performance tremendously. But, you know, even though there is a small risk of corruption, that's eh, probably fine. So I disabled that and, and within seconds of disabling that, the, uh, the Nextcloud installation finished and now we can complete it in the browser. As we go through the Nextcloud installation, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty point and click. There's a lot of great documentation for Nextcloud. They've put a really amazing product together. You can even self-host collaboration, like the whole shared document thing where multiple people are editing something at once. Well, you can do that and it's open source. And there's a lot of stuff to love about Nextcloud. This is just one thing. You can do all kinds of things with your portainer setup. I hole, theme cache, a lot of stuff that we covered in the past, and even more than that, there's all kinds of really awesome stuff in the thread, the home server thread at the uh, level one forum. So you can set up your own Zettelkasten with Obsidian. You could deploy GitLab or Githia. Githia. Yeah, you could. It's, it's exciting because you can do a lot. But the next thing that we need to work on is how you get here. We're not gonna expose this to the internet. We've done tutorials in the past. If you need to do that, you can set up a proxy and forward your public facing internet traffic to the proxy. You could set up a virtual machine in Linode where your internet traffic will go there and then it will selectively forward traffic to these containers and your, your internal machines. We've done those tutorials before. You should definitely check those out. Come to the level one forums if you have trouble finding those. But in this case, we're gonna do something different. Instead of exposing this to the internet, we're gonna set up TailScale. TailScale is a VPN service that's built on WireGuard, but it's meant that you install the TailScale client on all of your devices, and then all of your devices are sort of participating in this cloud VPN thing. The traffic doesn't actually travel to the internet and back most of the time, uh, but it is a really convenient way that you can expose all this stuff to one or more collections of devices, but without opening it up to the internet at large. It is a deny by default setup. So let's get our tail scale Docker container set up so that everything can connect to everything else. Oh, and you can use it to expose other stuff on your LAN. So 
we're setting this up so that you can get to the docker containers but it'll also be able to get to your true nas machine if you want it to and anything else on your network according to whatever security policy you set so before we set up the the container we actually need to set up tailscale itself you can just use you know use tailscale login use social login and you get this screen by default if you've never used it before which is let's add a device and you click up here and it's just it's kind of worthless what you actually need to do is to go to this screen it's linked to in the in the forum and you want to generate an auth key we're going to use this auth key to set up the docker container once you've got your auth key you can head on over to portainer and we're ready to copy paste that docker compose yml into the stack area all right, once you paste in from, you know, the, uh, the the guide on the level one forum, or this is what you should be seeing, I've updated the volumes to use our NFS volume, and you've got this TS underscore auth underscore key. Very important. I've also set up the routes. So, you know, 192.168.1.0, you know, maybe another network makes sense for your configuration, but uh, the auth key is what you get from the GUI on the other system. So you'll want to paste that in here and set up the container. Once I had the tail scale stack going, I went to the tail scale website to try to make sure that I could see the client. And at first I couldn't see the client. So what I ended up doing was running uh, from the command line, a command to use the off key and connect. And then I could see in the logs in Portainer that, okay, yes, it's established, it's connected. It's on my actual public IP address. Uh, this will work behind carrier grade NAT, so if you don't have a real IP address, it'll maybe give you some clues in the portainer logs. But the important thing was from then on, I was connected. And so the next thing to do now that that's connected is also get my phone connected. So I use Google Play to install the Tailscale app, and then I signed into the Tailscale app um, using my credentials. And when I did that, you know, my phone showed up on the Tailscale website, and then I connected. And when I went to load, it gave me an IP address, an internal IP address, sort of kind of 100 dot, that's like the carrier grade NAT thing. So 100 dot something. And I could access Nextcloud, but it says, oh, this is a, you're accessing it from a name that um, is not the normal name. You should edit config settings.php if you want to allow it from here. But really what I want to do is, is route the whole subnet. The way that you do that is you go into the GUI for tail scale and that's in the guide on the level one form. So you just toggle a thing that says, yes, this subnet should be something that you route. So once I did that, and then I disconnected and reconnected on my phone, boom, Nextcloud. I can log in on my phone with Nextcloud. I haven't forwarded any ports through the firewall. I haven't done anything else. This is just the Tailscale VPN punching a hole through the other firewalls that exist and my my phone having a firewall and giving me a little prompt here and saying, okay, yes, you can access that. But more importantly, I can access other LAN IP addresses. So no matter what I've mapped in terms of ports with Portainer and Docker, those are gonna be accessible with their LAN IP address. And you can even jump through a couple more hoops and get uh, everything on your LAN routing through the tail scale connection or you can set up a tail scale connection on a desktop computer or other machines on your network, depending on what it is you want to access or how you want to access it. But that's uh, maybe a little bit more of a write up for another day. As you go through the guide on the forum, one other thing that I'll mention is you do have to enable network address translation and IP forwarding. Um, that is part of the tail scale documentation. There's a link to it in the guide, but minimally you'll have to enable IP V4 forwarding ipv6 forwarding probably because i'm not sure how it works internally uh but also ip masquerading or network address translation nat basically the reason for that is because when traffic from your tail scale ip like say traffic from my phone hits the internal lan if the uh if there's no network address translation going on changing the apparent ip address that the traffic is coming from the machine that's responding to the request from my phone will try to send it through the default gateway, your router to the internet. And that of course is gonna have no idea how to send traffic over tail scale. So if this is new territory for you, I'm sorry, you're building a really complicated internal model of like the networking and how the networking bits work together and how all the moving, moving parts come together. And it's sort of complicated and I'm sorry for that. And this has also been a little bit more of a hairy uh, introduction than I really wanted. Sorry for that. But at this point, you should be up and running with tail scale. 
and you have Nextcloud kind of as proof, but you can also go hog wild adding uh, Docker containers to your FreeNAS system. And because you're using NFS storage, it is a way you're doing it in kind of a way that's forward compatible. So if something bad happens to your virtual machine or your virtual machine file, as long as you have that ZFS data set, you can roll back and do whatever it is that you need to do. You could even create more data sets. If you had a, uh, uh, you know, a lot of stuff in your next cloud container, you can make the next cloud uh, volume its own data set so a data set within a data set zfs doesn't care it's not really within zfs does some some funky stuff to just make it its own standalone data set but it's kind of organized hierarchically but it's not actually organized hierarchically for you know how it's uh how it's actually set up under the hood but having your own data set that way means you can start doing fun things like snapshots and, and controls so you could create a snapshot of just next cloud and when you do an update or major uh, you know thing if you needed to roll back you totally could do that and that's the volume it's not the whole container you don't need all the other stuff it's just your data same with the database aspect of it same with everything else so i don't know about you but i sleep better at night having that that uh, that volume uh, that data set and then also it helps you pick and choose which things you want to back up there's a, this three two one backup philosophy which you've if you haven't heard that before you should check it out because this doesn't cover you in all scenarios three two one does the best job at covering you in all scenarios for backup and having the the docker volumes accessible and browsable and you can see what data is in them pretty plainly and make copies and backups as you need to you, know, you could copy the stuff to a, a usb flash drive pretty easily and with other setups that would be a lot more complicated i like being able to get my hands around that kind of stuff really easily without having to think about it too much or do too much digging so hopefully this tutorial is useful definitely give it a thumbs up or a comment or something if it was you know really good for you or whatever uh, i'm wendell this is level one i'm signing out and you can find me in the level one forums and hey you know as time goes on the guide will be updated so check that out first sort of read through it all before embarking all right signing out and you can find me in the level one forums